Hi, I'm Kat and today I have for you a true crime case award in Romanian and I will also be doing my makeup at the same time. So let's start with the word. Numărătoare inversă. Nu mă ră toa re in ver să. Numărătoare inversă. Numărătoare inversă. Well done, guys! You just said countdown. Marshall Lee Gore was an American convicted murderer and rapist who was executed by the state of Florida in 2013 for the 1988 murders of two women. He also raped and tried to kill a third woman before kidnapping her two-year-old son. And this video was requested by my YouTube viewer CSM4913 and I really appreciate you sharing your experience and I know that this is very close to you so I'm going to start with the things that you've told me so that we can share with everyone. I hope it's okay to refer to you as C. C knew Marshall and he seemed to be a weirdo really. C's best friend rented a room for him in a very large home placed on a few acres of land in Homestead, Florida. Marshall killed a girl from Mississippi, took her car, her jewelry, disposed of her body and then made his way to Miami, Florida. Of course, we will get into more detail later on. C's friend had no idea about his secret and allowed him to take care of her disabled, blind, elderly father and teenage daughter. According to C, Marshall raped the teenage daughter, groomed her for a very long time and gave her jewelry that he had stolen from his victims. By that point, he had already killed another young girl and discarded her body in C's friend's horse field. Another one of C's friends took Marshall out to a bar where he gave an exotic dancer a ride home with her young child. All of a sudden, he started stabbing her in front of C's friend, so the friend of course stopped the car and told him not to do that, but Marshall started chasing the girl. She was able to get away with her son. Due to lack of evidence, he was only charged with one murder. While he was on death row, he called C and the friends who testified against him to threaten them. C, I just want to say I'm so sorry that you and your friends had to go through this. I hope that you are doing well and are okay. So let's find out who this excuse of air sucking parasite was. It might seem at times that we keep jumping timelines, but I'll try to, you know, make it as clear as possible for you guys to follow. Marshall Lee Gore was born on August the 17th, 1963 in Chicago, Illinois and grew up in a troubled family. He was the second of five children born to Jimmy Joe Gore and Brenda McCurry Gore. Marshall's parents married in Chicago in 1961 and then moved to the Miami area. Marshall attended Miami's Edison Senior High School but dropped out in his senior year. Marshall's parents frequently got in trouble with the law. His father, Jimmy, was arrested on felony charges in three different states. Some of Marshall's siblings were also arrested for various offenses and Marshall was arrested at least eight times for multiple offenses throughout the 1980s in Miami-Dade County, Florida. Marshall had a troubled home life because his parents, they were constantly fighting and his father had a history of domestic abuse. Their marriage wasn't a great one and it led to Brenda eventually filing for divorce in 1987 due to abuse and violence. Marshall stayed with his father in Florida and worked as a bouncer at a bar that his father owned. His adulthood was filled with violence. He was known to have an aggressive and violent behavior. He had a series of low paying jobs working as a laborer at the shipment company and also as a mechanic in a car repair shop. He also worked for a short time as a dancer at Solid Gold in North Miami-Dade. Marshall never got married but there were rumors that he was involved 
with a woman called Dennis Waugh. Marshall's murderous spree began on January 30, 1988, when 19-year-old Susan Marie Rourke, a Tennessee college student, disappeared. She had been a student at nearby Cleveland State University. Susan lived with her grandmother and told her grandmother that she was going to a party thrown by her close friend Michelle Trammell at her trailer home just outside of Cleveland, Tennessee. Susan arrived at the party between 9 and 10 in the evening. She was supposed to be with her expected date, but he had car problems, so instead she turned up with a man that she met at the Rocky Top Market in Cleveland on her way to the party. She introduced him to the others at the party as Tony. A few hours later, Susan, who planned to spend the night at Michelle's, left the party to drive Tony back to Cleveland. She had asked Michelle to go with her, but when Michelle fell asleep, she decided to take Tony back into town on her own. They left the party around midnight in uh, Susan's black 1986 Ford Mustang GT. Susan didn't return and she was never heard from again. She was last seen alive with Marshall leaving the trailer park in Bradley County, Tennessee. Marshall had planned to travel to Florida with a friend from Cleveland. While waiting for his friend at a convenience store, Marshall uh, struck a conversation with Susan. He then went into her car, they drove away and got to the party. Susan had called her grandmother to tell her that she will be spending the night with Michelle in Cleveland, but she would be home in time to go to church in the morning. She was expected home by 7 a.m. But Susan never showed up for church the next morning on January 31st as she promised her grandmother that she would. When she didn't return by Sunday afternoon, her family became concerned. They began trying to track her down by calling several of her friends, including Michelle. With no luck, her family reported her missing to the Cleveland police. The Cleveland Police Department launched a missing persons investigation headed by Detective Dewey Chastain. Police interviewed Susan's friends and acquaintances and began searching the area of Bradley County near Michelle's trailer. They issued a bolo, which is basically be on the lookout to local law enforcement agencies. The Mustang's license plate number was entered into the National Crime Information Center database ensuring that if the car is stopped by law enforcement anywhere in the country, it would be flagged when the officer would run the plates through the computer. Susan had given Michelle and the other partygoers the address of a house in Cleveland where she was taking Tony. Around February the 10th, the detective went to the address and interviewed Brenda Gore, Marshall's mom. She told him that her son, referring to him as Mars Gore, had recently been in Cleveland visiting her. He resided in Miami and he was released from federal prison in Florida after serving time for a firearms conviction. She gave the detectives photos of her son and Michelle and the others at her party all positively identified the man in the photos as Tony, the man with whom Susan had left the party. On February 11th, Cleveland police used the local media to publicly ask for information regarding Susan's disappearance. The plea indicated that there was a prime suspect in the disappearance, but they didn't mention Marshall's name. Marshall arrived in Tampa on January 31st, driving a black Mustang. He convinced a friend to help him pawn several items of jewelry which were later identified as belonging to Susan. He then traveled to Miami and on February 14th on Valentine's Day Marshall attacked a Miami waitress raping and stabbing her. The waitress, she actually survived the attack and Marshall abandoned the stolen Mustang there. Early in the morning on Sunday, February 14th, 1988, a black Ford Mustang GT crashed with another car in Miami, Florida. The Mustang's driver fled the scene on foot and the Miami Police Department had the car towed to an impound lot. The registration in the glove compartment identified the owner as Harold Rourke, Susan's father. A traffic citation found inside the car 
had been issued to a Marshall Lee Gore. The discovery of the Mustang in South Florida indicated that if Sarah had been abducted, it was likely she was transported across state lines. Because of this, the FBI opened a potential kidnapping file and joined the investigation into Susan Rourke's disappearance. While agents in Tennessee assisted the Cleveland police in their search for any sign of Susan, agents in South Florida were alerted to be on the lookout for Mars Gore or, as we know him, Marshall. In early March, after receiving a call from the Knoxville, Tennessee office of the FBI, agent James Barrow of the Bureau's Tampa, Florida office began investigating a possible connection between Marshall and a University of Tampa student, Susan Brown. Susan had attended high school in Miami with Marshall and the two dated for some time. Agent Barrow interviewed Susan Brown and learned from her that Marshall had stayed with her in Tampa in January before traveling to Cleveland, Tennessee to visit his mother. Marshall had visited Susan Brown unexpectedly in Tampa on January 31st, 1988, the day after Susan's disappearance. He appeared at the Domino's pizza franchise that Susan was working at. Susan Brown, I mean. He arrived alone driving a black Ford Mustang. He told her that he drove all night from Tennessee to Tampa and the Mustang was a gift from his mother. Susan Brown told him that uh, he would have to get a hotel room because he couldn't stay with her. Marshall asked her for help, pawning some jewelry so he could pay for the room. Over the course of two days, they visited numerous pawn shops in Tampa and pawned several items of jewelry. About a month earlier, he had stayed with her in her dorm room on his way from Miami to Cleveland, Tennessee to visit his mother. Marshall told Susan Brown that he had lost his license and because identification is required to pawn an item, he would need someone to go with him, so she agreed to do so. Much of the pawned jewelry was identified later at trial to be Susan Rourke's. When Susan Brown asked him how he got the jewelry, he said it belonged to a girlfriend of his. One of the rings Marshall tried to pawn had Susan Rourke's initials and the pawn shop refused to accept the rings because the initials engraved in the ring didn't match Susan Brown's initials. Carolyn Rourke, Susan's stepmother, was able to identify some of the jewelry as Susan's. On February the 1st, Marshall was supposed to meet Susan Brown at a diner, but he didn't show up and she didn't see him again. Agent Barrow visited the pawn shops described by Susan Brown and recovered the jewelry. On March 11th, Agent Barrow learned from Susan Brown that Marshall was staying in the Miami area with a friend of Susan Brown's called Rosa Lastinger. From February the 1st, when Susan Brown last saw Marshall, to February the 4th, when he moved in with Rosa Lastinger, there is only one known instance of Marshall's whereabouts. Sergeant John D. Ross of the Florida Highway Patrol at 10.32 a.m. on February the 2nd stopped a black Ford Mustang GT that was southbound on Interstate 75 just outside of Punta Gorda. He stopped the car for speeding and issued a traffic citation to the driver whose license identified him as Marshall Gore. The Cleveland police had not entered yet information about Susan Rourke's car into the database at the time of this stop. Susan introduced Rosa to Marshall while she was home in Miami for the 1987-1988 Christmas New Year's holiday season. On February the 4th, 1988, Rosa received a call from her employer, a car dealership in Miami, informing her that a man named Tony was at the dealership asking to see her. When the man was put on the phone, Rosa recognized Tony as Marshall. He told her that he wanted to trade in a car and Rosa made an appointment to meet him at the dealership. After they met, Marshall began filling in the paperwork for trading in a black Ford Mustang GT, but he was unable to complete the transaction 
because he didn't have the car's title and registration. He explained to Rosa that the paperwork was at his father's house and he was unable to get it because he and his father had a falling out. When he informed Rosa that he didn't have a place to stay in Miami, she invited him to stay at her home and he accepted. At the time Marshall moved into Rosa's home, others apart from her were also living there. Among them was Marisol Cotto and her 13-year-old daughter Jessie Casanova. Marshall, driving the black Mustang, had been pulled over and cited for speeding on February 11 and Rosa was with him in the car. The day before he received the citation, the Cleveland police re-entered the Mustang's tag number into the database in connection with a missing person's file. But the tag number was entered incorrectly, so running the Mustang's tag number through the database as part of the traffic stop would have turned up nothing. The error was only discovered much later after the car had been impounded and the Miami Police Department identified the owner. In the early morning hours of February 14, 1988, Marshall called Rosa telling her that he had been in an accident while driving the Mustang. He asked her to pick him up and when she did so, he was on foot and the Mustang was nowhere to be seen. Manuel Garcia Linares, a Miami physician, was in an accident with a black Ford Mustang GT in the early morning of February 14 and the driver of the other car fled the scene of the accident on foot. And of course that this was the same Mustang, Susan Rourke's, and the driver who fled was Marshall. On the same day, on February 14th, Marshall allegedly assaulted and slashed the throat of Maria Dominguez and on February 20th, he allegedly assaulted Lisa Ingram. In the meantime, the US Marshal Service was also looking for Marshall. On March 12, 1988, a deputy US Marshal visited Marshall's father's construction site in Miami and asked to speak to Marshall. Marshall was serving a five-year term of probation handed down by the U.S. District Court for the Southern District of Florida for having been convicted of being a felon in possession of a firearm. The District Court issued a warrant for his arrest on February 24, 1988 for violating the conditions of his probation. He had given his probation officer, his father's construction site, as his place of employment, but when the deputy arrived, he wasn't there. During the six weeks that Marshall lived with uh, Rosa Lestinger, he had given Jessica Sanova, the 13-year-old girl, several gifts. A key given to Jesse as a gift was actually the key to Susan Rourke's Mustang. Marshall had also taken a box of cassette tapes from the car and gave the tapes to Jesse as a gift. On March the 12th, the day before Rosa asked Marshall to move out of her house, he murdered Robin Novick. When Marshall left in a taxi cab on March 11, 1998, 1988, Jesse had lent him $100. On March 14, 1988, the day after Marshall moved out of Rosa's home, a woman named Tina Corollis was assaulted, knocked unconscious and left for dead in a wooded area in Dade County, Florida. Despite being seriously injured, she survived the assault and she was able to get to a phone and call for help. Her assailant fled with her car and her toddler son, Jimmy, who had been in the back seat of the car, was nowhere to be found. Within 24 hours of the assault, Metro-Dade police identified a prime suspect, Mars Gore. Metro-Dade police joined the already ongoing coordinated effort by the FBI and the Cleveland, Tennessee police to locate Marshall. On March 17, 1988, a specialist in the Miami Police Department crime lab processed the Black Ford Mustang GT, which was still being held in an impound lot, and he identified latent prints on the driver's side window. These prints were later matched to Marshall. The specialist found traces of blood in the car and the number of items recovered from the car were later identified as belonging to Susan Rourke. On March 17, the same day the Mustang was being processed by the crime lab specialist, 
an FBI agent assigned to the Paducah, Kentucky office, was dispatched to interview a local resident called Rex Gore. The agent was told that a probation violation warrant had been issued for Rex Gore's nephew, Mars Gore, or Marshall, and that Marshall was also a suspect in several federal and state criminal investigations. The agent, accompanied by other agents and uh, local law enforcement, went to Rex Gore's home where they learned from him and his wife that Marshall had arrived unexpectedly in Kentucky that week and remained in the area visiting his cousin. The agents went to the cousin's trailer in uh, Ledbetter, Kentucky, where they found Marshall alone, executed the warrant for his arrest for probation violation and took him into custody. While he was being detained in Hopkinsville, two additional warrants were issued for his arrest. On 18th of March, a Southern District Florida magistrate judge is issued a warrant for his arrest for kidnapping Tina's son. And on March 22nd, the Dade County Florida Circuit Court issued a warrant for his arrest for the assault and the attempted murder of Tina Corollis. On March 23rd, the U.S. Marshal Service and the FBI transported Marshall to Miami. At the Metro-Dade Police Headquarters, Detective Simmons advised Marshall of his Miranda rights and offered him an opportunity to call the Dade County Public Defender's Office. He declined and Detective Simmons then questioned him for seven hours regarding Susan Rose's disappearance, the assault on Tina Corollis and the February 14th assault of a third woman, Maria Dominguez. On April the 2nd, 1988, almost three months later, four members of the Columbia County Florida Sheriff's Office mounted patrol were searching a wooded area near Interstate 75 for Leroy Mills, an elderly man who had been reported missing. Instead of finding the man, they found the decomposed body of a young woman. The naked body was found in a wooded area which had been used as an unauthorized dumping ground for household garbage. Sergeant Randall Roberts, who responded to the initial call from the mounted police, and Detective Neil Nydam, the chief investigator, described the scene where the body was found. A shoelace tied around the left wrist led them to conclude that she had been bound and to classify the case as a probable homicide. Several strands of hair were found in the woman's hand. Beer bottles and an empty cigarette pack were found near the body, as were a torn t-shirt, a pair of women's underwear and a ripped panty liner. When the body was moved, a pair of earrings were found underneath. A search for fingerprints turned up no useful latent prints. Following the identification by medical experts of the likely gender and the proximate age of the deceased, Detective Nydam sent out a national teletype with a description of the victim. The Cleveland Police Department saw the teletype, contacted Detective Nydam and sent him a copy of Susan Rourke's dental records. Susan's dentist, Vernon Bryant, said that the dental records confirmed the body found in Columbia County was that of Susan Rourke. Forensic anthropologist William Maples said that the extreme decomposition of the left breast indicated that there may have been an injury to the area, making it the easiest target for insects and other factors of decomposition. A small nick in the bone at the base of the skull was most likely the result of a knife wound to that area. Given the level of decomposition, the body could have been in the Columbia County woods anywhere from two weeks to six months before it was discovered, but a two to four month range was the most likely scenario. Deputy Chief Medical Examiner Bonifacio Floro said that the string found on the wrist had been tied sufficiently tightly before death to leave a mark. The likely cause of death was homicidal violence. The decomposition of the neck was consistent with strangulation or a neck injury and this was the likely cause of death. Susan was probably placed where she was found within a half an hour of her death and she likely died around two months before her body was discovered. Unfortunately, I couldn't find much background information on the victims in this case. What we know about Susan Marie Rourke is that she was born on 1st of January 1969 in Birchwood, Hamilton County, Tennessee, 
to Elizabeth Ann Moss. She was a student who sadly died on 31st of January 1988 according to records in Lake City, Columbia County, Florida. On March 11, 30-year-old Robin Gale Novick, a General Motors Credit Services representative from Lauder Hill, who was working for a short time as a dancer on the side, was still leaving the parking lot of a tavern in her yellow Corvette. She had told friends she planned to meet someone in Dade County. Linda Williams saw Robin at the tavern at around 9 p.m. and when Robin left, she got into the driver's side of her yellow Corvette and the white male, similar looking to Marshall, was in the passenger seat. On 12th of March 1988, at around 2 a.m., Marshall returned to Jessica Sanova's house driving a light-colored Corvette. This was the day before Rosa had asked him to move out of the house. David Restrepo was woken up by Marshall in the early hours of the same night and at that time Marshall was driving a yellow Corvette with Robin on the tag. David and Marshall drove to a strip club where he waited in the car whilst Marshall went inside. Marshall told David that he wanted to be called Robin from then on and that the yellow Corvette was borrowed from a girlfriend. Mark Joy worked at the strip club called the Organ Grinder and saw Marshall showing up at the club driving a yellow car with Robin on the tag. After Marshall wrecked the Corvette while they were running away from the scene, Marshall told David that the car was stolen. In the early hours of March 12, around 3 a.m., Coral Gables patrolman James Avery heard the sounds of a car wreck. He followed gouge marks and leaked fluid on the road and found a wrecked yellow Corvette with license tags reading Robin. Inside the car, the patrolman found a gold cigarette case with the victim's initials along with her driver's license and several credit cards. Another officer also searched the car and found the power of attorney executed by Marshall Gore. Marshall returned the following afternoon by taxicab again to Jesse's house and said that the Corvette belonged to a friend and he then gave Jesse the keys to the car as a gift. You remember Jesse is the 13 year old girl. On 13th of March between 11 and 12 at night Marshall went to Frank McKee's home and told him that the police was looking for him because he had been driving a Corvette and wrecked it. Rex Gore, Marshall's uncle and his wife Ashley said that Marshall had arrived unexpectedly at their home in Ledbetter, Kentucky on March 15, 1988. He was driving a red Toyota Corolla. So now the yellow Corvette was gone. On March 14, Marshall attacked a third woman. He abducted 32-year-old Tina Corrales, a new dancer from Broward. They had previously gone on one date and he called her on March 14, telling her that this Corvette had broken down, asking her for a ride to another car. She took her 3-year-old son Jimmy and picked Marshall up in Fort Lauderdale in her brand new red Toyota Corolla. Baby Jimmy was in a car seat in the back. After driving for a few hours around Miami looking for Marshall's replacement car, he asked her to pull over so that he could relieve himself. When he returned to the car, he brandished a knife and ordered her to move over to the passenger seat. He then got behind the wheel and drove to a wooded area. Tina was unable to see where they were going. When he stopped the car, Marshall raped her at knife point, then pulled her out of the car, hit her in the face with a rock and choked her. He left her there thinking he probably killed her. When she regained consciousness, she was naked and Marshall, her car and her son Jimmy were gone. Her jewelry was also missing and when she awoke again in a hospital, she discovered she had been stabbed. Marshall had beat her with a rock, raped her, choked her, stabbed her, then slit her throat with a knife. He left her for dead by the side of a road near to where he had dumped Robin's body. He stole her car and drove off, abducting her two-year-old son Jimmy, who was still sitting in the back of the vehicle. Soon after assaulting Tina, Marshall stopped at a pawn shop in Miami where he pawned some of her jewelry. His fingerprint was found on the pawn shop receipt. The person Marshall dealt with identified him. 
Tina survived the attack, she ended up in hospital and she alerted police. After attacking Tina, Marshall fled the state and headed to Georgia where he left Jimmy, the two-year-old, locking him in the pantry of an abandoned barn before heading north towards Kentucky. On March 16, while police were searching for Jimmy, they came across the body of a woman who was found close to the place he left Tina. While on patrol in rural Dade County, Officer Norman Shipes found the body beside the road at Southwest 243rd Street and 214th Place. The location was close to Rosa Lestinger's home, where Marshall stayed for a while. The medical examiner found a belt wrapped around the body's neck and a white cloth around the left ankle. The body was nude, there were two stab wounds to the chest and abrasions on the neck under the belt. The victim was alive when she was strangled and the cause of death was stab wounds associated with mechanical strangulation. The victim was identified as Robin Novick. Unfortunately, we don't have many details about Robin. She was born on 21st of September 1957 and Florida death records show that she died in Miami-Dade County but she lived in Lauder Hill, Broward County at the time of her death. Her body was found on March 16, 1988 and that's why her Florida death records shows March 16, 1988 as her date of death. Luckily, Jimmy, Tina's two-year-old baby who was kidnapped by Marshall was found unharmed on the same day in the barn in Georgia. He was flown to Miami and stayed with relatives in Broward. Marshall was dragged to a trailer in Paducah, Kentucky, near the Missouri-Illinois border. At the time he disappeared, Marshall was desperate for money and investigators believed that he would try to get money from relatives and friends in Kentucky and Tennessee. And they were right, because after the FBI interviewed several of his relatives and friends, they managed to track him down to the trailer. He was captured on March 17 at 6 p.m. unarmed and without incident. Near the trailer, police found the stolen car, the red Toyota that belonged to Tina, Jimmy's mom. This trailer was owned by Marshall's cousin. After Marshall was arrested, he was questioned about all three crimes. David Simmons of the Metro-Dade Police Department and Officer Parr interviewed Marshall on 24th of March 1988. Marshall denied ever driving a yellow Corvette or knowing the victim. He asked to see a photo of the victim but said, quote, just make sure it's not a gory one, my stomach can't take it, end of quote. Up to that point, no one said that the victim was dead. When given the photo, Marshall covered his eyes with his hand and turned away and then said he didn't recognize the victim. The officers told him that he was a suspect in the victim's murder and they also found a paper with his name on it in her car. Marshall then stated, quote, if I did this, I deserve the death penalty, end of quote. Marshall initially denied knowing any of the victims and he even tried claiming that he was the biological father of Jimmy, Tina's son but he later testified that all of the victims worked for him at an escort service that he owned. At Marshall's trial, he chose to represent himself. During the trial, Mike Decora of the Metro-Dade Police Department testified that Jessica Sanova gave him a key that fit Robin's yellow Corvette. Remember Jesse, Marshall used to live in her house before her mother asked him to move out. She was the one who gave him the $100. Marshall made frequent verbal outbursts during his trial and even laughed out loud and even howled. He was convicted of two counts of first degree murder, two counts of attempted murder, two counts of kidnapping and seven counts of sexual battery. He was sentenced to two death penalties, seven life sentences and an additional 110 years for his other crimes. The jury recommended that he be sentenced to death by a unanimous vote. In 1998, Marshall won a new trial when the Supreme Court of Florida found that the prosecutor asked him inappropriate questions during his initial trial. In 1999, following a second trial, the jury found him guilty 
and he was sentenced to death again. His execution was rescheduled a total of four times in 2013 alone. He was first scheduled to be executed on 24th of June, but it was halted because of questions about his sanity. He was granted a stay of execution just one hour before he was supposed to receive the little injection after his lawyers claimed that he was insane. It came after he enjoyed his last meal of a ribeye steak and a Coca-Cola. And I wouldn't honestly even give him that, not even a Coca-Cola if I'm honest. His attorneys have previously argued that he's mentally ill and one lawyer claimed he was mentally deranged and not responsible for his actions. Marshall also claimed that the date of his scheduled execution, June 24th, 2013, adds up to 666 and he's a target of Satan worshippers who have threatened that date by mail for years. But Marshall had no significant history of mental illness and in May 2013, a panel of psychiatrists found that he was mentally sound. They said that he claimed the Illuminati wanted him dead to sell his organs, a story they say he made up to manipulate the judicial process and avoid responsibility for his past actions. Relatives of Robbie Novick, who had traveled from Ohio to witness the execution, were devastated. The family of Susan Marie Rourke was also present. They are upset, said retired Lieutenant Neil Nydam, who was with the Rourke family. This has been going on for 25 years. They are trying to find closure and it's not going to happen today, end of quote. The execution was rescheduled for July that year, but halted again due to sanity concerns. Governor Rick Scott then rescheduled the execution for September the 10th. However, Florida Attorney General Pam Bondi rescheduled the execution's date so that she could attend a political fundraiser. She later apologized for doing so. The execution was rescheduled for the 1st of October. After 23 years on death row, Marshall Lee Gore was finally executed by lethal injection at Florida State Prison on October the 1st, 2013. He was 50 years old when he was executed. His execution was the result of a long legal battle as his lawyers had argued that he was mentally ill and not fit to be put to death. His last meal was a can of Coca-Cola as he rejected his original requested last meal of sausage and pepperoni pizza. In addition to the murders of Robin and Susan, Marshall was also suspected of several other killings, including the death of two women in Ohio and one in Georgia. However, he was never charged with these crimes. He was a suspect in the murder of a young woman called Tiffany Sessions, who disappeared in 1989 while walking near her home in Gainesville, Florida. Marshall was questioned about this case, but he was never charged. He was also suspected in the disappearance of another woman named Tracy Ocasio, who vanished in 2009 after leaving a bar in Orlando, Florida. Marshall was briefly a suspect in this case, but he was later cleared. Despite the numerous murders and disappearance he was suspected of, Marshall was only ever convicted of the murders of Robin and Susan. The families of his victims, Robin Gayle Novick and Susan Marie Rourke, watched in silence through the glass window on his execution day. For the two victims and the many other lives he affected, Marshall Ligor's execution was an end to a long and painful chapter in their lives. Despite his death, the victims' families are still trying to heal and come to terms with the loss of their loved ones. So I believe that it's safe to assume that Marshall Lee Gore was a serial killer, but unfortunately he was only ever convicted for two murders. And it breaks my heart for the families that they had to go through 25 years before finally getting some closure. I can't even begin to imagine how that must feel like. It's 25 years. How many days is that? That's over 9,000 days where you have to wake up every day not knowing when justice will be served. On another note, I'm just really happy that Tina managed to survive and it's a huge relief that he didn't do anything to Jimmy, her two-year-old son. He would have been even more tragic. Many thanks to CSM4913 for suggesting this case and thank you everybody for watching. Uh, for now, 
we got to the end of the video if you are interested in any of the makeup that i use for this look all of the products are linked in the description below and like you might know already i take care suggestions so if you have any case in particular that you want me to look at just leave any details you have in the comments under this video for now stay safe take care and i'll see you in the next one bye